Wonderful. All right. Well, like was just shared, um, my name is Kelsey Greenberg Young. I am the Education Director for the San Diego Anti-Defamation League, or ADL. Um, and without, you know, boring any of you too much with how I have ended up here on my long and winding journey, I do want to share that um, I ended up in anti-bias work and anti-hate work, basically because of my experience as a student. Um, a high school student where I saw bias and um, discrimination and identity based bullying too frequently happening to my LGBTQ friends. Um, and after high school, I decided, you know what, I need to do something about this to make schools safer spaces. And after that long journey, uh, lo and behold, I ended up as the education director for the ADL. So that's just a little bit about me. Hey everyone, I'm Kathy Lee and I'm the assistant education director for ADL in San Diego and in Arizona. Um, and I would love to invite you all to turn your screens on today if you would like. So thank you to those that have it on already. And Lisa, I love the rainbows behind you. So thank you for that. <laughs> um, we are gonna try to make this um, a little bit interactive. Plus we'll have some breakout rooms in the second half. So. Um, you'll definitely want to have your screens on for that small group discussion. Um, and we also invite you to rename yourself. So you can click on the three little dots in the top right corner of your picture and hit rename, um, leaving um, at least your first name um, and then adding the grade levels that you serve um, and your pronouns if you would like. Um, and maybe the school, if you would like that, or you can put your school and hello to everybody in the chat. Um, but the reason that we'd like you to rename yourself is because during the breakout rooms, um, we're gonna try to pair you with other folks that serve similar grade levels so that you can have a fruitful conversation. Pass it back over to Kels. Did you introduce yourself, Kathy? Like how you um, got it? <laughs> So what brought me to ADL, do you mean? Yeah. <laughs> um, okay, so I was a high school history teacher for many years. Um, and then I joined the museum world and I worked at an anthropology museum here in San Diego, um, now called the Museum of Us. They just renamed from the Museum of Man. Um, and when I worked at the museum, I was in charge of their public programming. Um, and I really loved my favorite public programs that I built were for the exhibit, Race, Are We So Different? Um, so ADL kind of combines my love of education with social justice. Wonderful, thank you. All right, for those of you who don't know who ADL is, as Kathy and I are sharing with you how we ended up here, um, we are a 108 year old anti-hate organization. Um, and our mission has been the same since day one. It is to stop the defamation of the Jewish people and to secure justice and fair treatment to all people. Um, and one of the biggest ways that we fulfill our mission is through our work in education. Um, so working with school communities to help them understand um, identity, examine bias, and encourage personal responsibility in challenging bias and bullying within their students, within their colleagues, within their communities. Okay. Before we begin today, um, I want to remind everybody once again to please rename yourself if you can with those three little dots at the top of your window, your little video window, or by next to your name in the participants list with also your grade level serve. Love that everybody is saying hello in the chat with what school you are at. I actually recognize some of the names, so that's awesome. Um, but also please stick your grade level into your actual name. So like mine is Kelsey Greenberg Young, and I would say great, I would say K-12, because that's who I serve. And um, as part of those participation guidelines, including renaming yourself, there's just a few more that I would like us to agree to. Um, this is going to be a participatory session. Kathy and I will talk for um, the first half or so, but we are going to end up in breakout rooms engaging with one another. Um, we will also have some an opportunity in a minute for some uh, interaction with a poll. And we ask that you uh, are mindful of keeping all of keeping yourselves on mute, but also unmuting as soon as you're in those breakout rooms. And we ask you to just engage in those discussions with respect and empathy and an open mind for those you are listening to today, because um, we're all coming from different perspectives, which is fantastic. 
Um, and we are really here today to unpack some best practices for responding to bias incidents that happen in our schools. Um, we're going to reflect on where we stand in terms of those best practices and procedures for addressing those incidents. And we are going to do that work with some colleagues or some uh, some folks from across the county to plan out what our responses might look like if a bias incident were to take place. So let's get started with that first piece, Kathy. Okay, so to kick us off, we're going to ask you a couple of questions um, just to get a sense of everyone's experience with incidents of bias at your school. Um, so we're going to use a website called Mentimeter. Hopefully you have used it before. If not, welcome to uh, experimenting with Mentimeter. Um, so we're going to have you answer a couple of anonymous questions and then um, have the whole group contribute to a word cloud. So um, I am, oh, Kelsey already beat me to it, pasting a link into the chat right now. Um, you can just click on that first link that she, she pasted and it will take you, hopefully open up in a new browser for you so that you can answer those questions. Um, if that link does not work, just open up a new browser, type in menti.com and then use the code that's on the, the uh, it's not on the screen anymore, it's in the chat though. Um, and then that will take you to the prompts. So we're gonna give you just about 60 seconds or so um, to answer those questions and then we'll meet you back here. And you can all see on your screen, hopefully right now, how these answers are moving as um, different folks answer those questions. All right, are we probably about done? How about take another 15 seconds or so? And then pull everybody back to the main room so that we can look at how everyone responded. Um, so the first couple questions were some statements. So the first one, bias related incidents occur at your learning sites. We can see yes. Um, the majority of you experience bias uh, related incidents at your site. Um, and most of you feel like it is your responsibility addressing these incidents, which is not a surprise since you are here with us today. Um, and then the confident lev confidence level in addressing these um, looks like it's pretty good actually, which is wonderful. Hopefully we'll be able to give you a couple of new things to um, for your repertoire so you can add into that and really increase that comfort level for you in addressing these incident, incidents when they occur. So can we check out the word cloud? Yes, all right. Um, oh. mm. All right, so then we asked you for a couple of words about- I haven't your... done this one yet, Kathy. They have to do oh. it one at a time. Oh, okay, so head on back to Mentimeter. Um, for the word cloud, it's going to ask you for uh, a couple of words to share your feelings about addressing bias or hate related incidents. Um, hopefully this works. If uh, it's not working, if somebody could let us know, that'd be great. <laughs> yeah, if it says that it hasn't moved us to the next poll um, or the next question, go ahead and refresh and it should. But I'm with you. Let us know if it doesn't work. Technology. Huh. Always that. Uh, there we go. Oh, All here right. we go. Okay, so it's coming in. So um, nice. Or use the chat. So so we have educate and friendship in the chat. It's uncomfortable but necessary. Empathy, misunderstanding. This is interesting. I love how folks are taking different approaches to your feelings about addressing hate um, and bias. Some of you are taking like more of a positive spin and then others are the, the, taking the more negative, which is really interesting because it definitely plays into a lot of emotions, right? When these things happen, it's sometimes hard to keep our emotions as adults in check. Um, so getting all of this out is really, it's, it's important for us as educators to know that we're not alone in experiencing those um, 
vast amount of emotions that come with uh, uncomfortable situations like this. Um, all right, I think a couple more are still coming in, but um, thank you all for participating in our uh, technology experiment today. I always uh, cringe when we're doing some new things because you never know exactly how they're gonna work out, but this seemed to be to go well. So nice job participating. Um, and you can see that we're all coming uh, from different places on this topic, depending on our experiences. And probably it depends on the, the age of the folks that we serve every day as well. Um, so before we go further, into our uh, presentation, we're going to first get on the same page about some terminology. Um, so if you want to move away from the word cloud, Kelsey. Perfect. One, one. Okay, so um, the first thing to, to get on the same page about is what is a bias incident? So the way that we define a bias incident um, is a non-criminal conduct motivated by prejudice towards the victims or targets real or perceived identity. So then if you add in a criminal element, it becomes a hate crime. So bias incidents can involve hateful imagery, language, and sometimes actions. Um, and what Kelsey and I hear from schools the most um, are incidents of posting hate symbols or bigoted jokes um, online, sometimes social media, sometimes in Zoom chats, you never actually know where they're going to show up. Um, and also when, when we're in person, the use of bigoted insults, taunts, slurs that really like in person on campus that target specific identities on campus. Um, so those are what comes in the most, but you can see on the screen, there are lots of other types of bias incidents as well, and that's not an inclusive list. And, you know, sadly, we know that this is not infrequent in schools at all. A recent study from GLSEN shows that students are hearing biased remarks, slurs, things that target people for their gender, their ability, their race, their body size, their religion, their immigration status, and so on often. Like I look at this, uh, this graph and see that, no, no, it's, it's a lot. It's almost all the time. And then you add that to um, a recent ADL study that shows that little over or little less than half of American adults um, have experienced some type of online harassment because of those same categories, because of their identity. So you combine that with what students are hearing when they're actually physically on campus, which some of your students are, but many of them are still virtual. Combine that with how much we are now spending online um, from a very, very young age. You know, what was once maybe not until middle school or high school is now starting at elementary school. My next door neighbors spend a whole lot of time on YouTube, a whole lot of time on TikTok. I don't know how they get on there, but they're seven. So uh, thanks to the pandemic and thanks to the age we're in, we can only imagine what they are seeing either about identities in general or also, you know, towards each other. Now, some of you might be thinking like, Kelsey, Kathy, that sounds terrible, which it is, but it isn't really something that could happen at my school. Um, you know, you're using these big statistics, uh, but it can. <laughs> and I want to show you some examples, actually, that have happened in schools across the country, but with the caveat that in the ADL office in San Diego, we have had very similar reports um, of similar incidents shared with us over the past year or two. So I warn you, there's some unfortunate imagery coming up. First, this was a North Carolina high school. Um, they decided to hang a noose uh, as a senior prank um, not that long ago. Example A, a, a joke, a prank. Middle school, same thing. They had a noose hung in a bathroom, um, but it was not long after they had just had a viral video. So add that social media component to it of students chanting, build that wall that was shared across the student body. So two um, pretty nasty incidents of hate, uh, hate and harassment um, in a very short time span. We see incidents, we saw this incident, a very similar incident multiple times right here in San Diego of students writing anti-Semitic or hateful um, comments in yearbooks. Uh, this one says Hitler worshiper and you are a Jew. And we've seen it in bathroom walls. 
I just got a report of this uh, from a school right here in San Diego yesterday. And we've even seen it in second grade textbooks. So once again, uh, right here, this, these, this, this image isn't from right here, but I've had this reported to me second, third grade. Now we, right now we know it's really common for memes and social media to be shared and it's being done in hateful ways. This is a sixth grader uh, who was sending hateful and targeted memes to another sixth grader just via text message as a, a lens of harassment because they had had their actual romantic advances um, uh, rebuffed, which is like really tough to hear at this, at this level, but this is how that was that reaction. Um, you know, this was in Alabama um, it was a Snapchat that was taken on a spirit day. That spirit day was redneck spirit day. And as you can see in here, we have a black student being stood upon by his friends, friends in quotes, um, and then shared on Snapchat for all to see because, oh, isn't that funny? No. This was very recent. One of our offices reported um, a, a video where actual threats were made, where the N-word was used and shared across the campus um, on uh, different social media platforms as well. You know, this, this is one of those things that elevate things to a hate crime. So did some of that vandalism because there was real threats made, violence involved, but the slurs used and the identities targeted um, were was painful. And uh, this one too, I mentioned TikTok earlier. Students drawing swastikas on each other and then posting it to TikTok for all to see with a point of pride. And again, we've seen this too. You're not on campus or maybe you are and you are in elementary school and a neighbor, a community member, um, somebody else comes to your school and vandalizes it with um, hate symbols. Um, I've had reports of this to, here to me as well, whether it's on the school property right out front at the park next door. So although necessarily your students, young students were not involved in the perpetrating of this incident, they show up and they're, that's what's outside their school. So. So these things are happening. What do we do? what things should we be keeping in mind um, as we're still virtual now and then hopefully heading back into um, in person next year. Um, so in the resources for this um, presentation today, we included a guide. Um, and within that guide, there is uh, something called the PEACE resource. And PEACE is an acronym. So we're gonna go through that um, pretty high level now, but I highly recommend that you check out that resource and dive in a little deeper um, and then know that you can always reach out to Kelsey or myself um, for more information. But so let's dive in. So the first one is P. So prepare. Um, so don't wait until something happens to get prepared on how to respond. Plan ahead now. Um, so I'm going to ask you some rhetorical questions so that you can just kind of start thinking about this. Um, do you currently have a committee of students, family members, and staff already working on diversity, equity, and inclusion goals at your school? And do they meet throughout the school year? Do those team members understand the roles that they may be asked um, of them in connection with a future incident response, for example, investigating, communicating out to the community, um, maybe some community healing, um, or will you and your school be scrambling to meet and decide um, in the moment how to respond? Which as we saw at the word cloud, there's usually lots of emotions going on in the moment. So having a plan ahead of time is really important. Um, and you as counselors, which I'm assuming most of you are counselors, um, you have to be part of these conversations happening at your school. So if you are not part of those conversations right now, um, I challenge you to make that a goal for yourself to, to push your way into those conversations or start them if they haven't been started already. Um, so then once you are in these conversations, you'll want to update your policy and your plans. Um, so looking at your current policies on response, are they inclusive to all students? Are they equitably enforced? 
do they address incidents that take place in the digital space, not just in person, since so much of our school, all of our school pretty much um, is virtual right now. Um, and then review and publicize these policies often and in multiple languages so that you're not being exclusionary. Um, you should also be tracking your campus trends similar to the way law enforcement does uh, because when you track your trends, what's happening um, over and over and over, it gives you a better idea of the big picture. Um, and then consider standardizing a bias incident response form to guide and document information gathering after an incident. Um, and if you already have a form, take a look at it. Um, is it inclusive? Is it equitable? And does it eliminate bias or does it perpetuate bias? Um, and build relationships with relevant community bias uh, or based <laughs> bias is just on the, the mind right now, uh, community based organizations or partners and with law enforcement um, so that you can respond rapidly and comprehensively to an incident. Um, so again, I encourage you to take down Kelsey and my contact information and think of us as one of those community partners um, to support you with these incidents moving forward. So a secondary part of um, uh, of preparation is actually even encouraging the reporting of bias so that you can address them, right? If you don't know what's happening, how are you going to address them? So again, some more questions for you to consider of how are you fostering or are you fostering a culture where students feel comfortable reporting those bias incidents to staff? Do students even know what to do when a bias incident occurs? Like, have they been told about those procedures? Is there an actual mechanism that they go about doing it? Or is it going just to, do they just go to a staff person? Um, what, have, what has been communicated with them to let them know what they should be doing? And similar to Kathy's point of, is that mechanism accessible to students with disabilities? Um, you know, second language learners and immigrants. Are staff discussing the ways that you can be more approachable so that this does not just fall on you as counselors, right? This is something that is part of your job description um, in which students come to you for those types of needs, right? When they've been targeted this way, but it shouldn't fall on you. So what are, what are, how are those trusted adults being trained um, on, on what, on how to help and like, do those staff even know what their responsibilities are once again if a student comes to them so having those reporting mechanisms um set into place and encouraging that right away so having those conversations across all stakeholders of who how should we report how they should report who should they report to and what happens as soon as they get that report well that like that has to be put into place for that reporting to even take place and if you think about those questions and they you reaffirm this idea that your school is a safe zone, right? Where students understand um, and are reinforced with the idea that reporting an incident of bias will not make things worse. It's part of making things better, more inclusive and more safe um, for all students. And that reinforcement to them is part of that process. Um, and then every incident of bias should be taken as a serious ma uh, matter so that the school community knows that hateful bias language and actions are unacceptable. Um, so you need to take it seriously, no matter how small you think it might be, um, and then act quickly. Um, so that brings us to our third letter in our acronym, which is act quickly and respond. Um, so after you've confirmed that all students are safe, you will want to talk to everyone involved, most likely talk to them separately and as soon as possible. Um, and then use that standard bias incident reporting form that I mentioned um, so that things are not missed. And it also helps to mitigate our own bias if we have this standardized form. Uh, depending on the incident, you might need to preserve evidence and actually call in law enforcement. So that's always something to take into consideration. Um, something that I really work hard on to impart on folks when they call the, um, the ADL is to look at the bigger picture. Rarely do these incidents happen in a bubble. It usually is indicative of larger issues that are occurring on campus. Um, and part of this action is supporting students who are targeted and impacted in creating a space 
for processing emotions, validating experiences so that they feel seen and that they feel heard, um, and then evaluating any more resources that they might need. Um, and then if needed for the aggressor thinking about consequences, a big part of the preparation and ensuring that the consequences you are considering are equitable um, and dis, a disproportionate or poorly communicated response can perpetuate and solidify biases. So really thinking about the consequences that we're imposing um, and if we're part of the problem or trying to actually be part of the solution. Um, and I know that a lot of this, especially when we get into disciplinary action, falls on administration, but they should be supported by a robust team that are thinking through these responses to incidents, um, and counselors' voices are really a key part of that team. Now, a step that often falls to the wayside, um, and I have to remind folks to do a lot, is to communicate with the entire school community um, with the appropriate confidentialities in mind that an incident of bias occurs. So that leads us to our C, communicate. Um, incidents of bias when they happen on campus are brought, like have to be brought forth and spoken about and exposed so that the public, families and students all understand that there's no tolerance for this, right? And these messages are likely going to be customized based off of your age level, based off of the audience. But we know that word travels quickly, right? We were talking about this as we started today, like the power of students is, is um, immense and that includes to share information. So it's better for it to come from us with the appropriate um, information, like so that they have the facts and can understand the, the messages being sent by the school, which means describing the incident um, without identifying information, obviously, and censoring any slurs, but like owning it, naming it, saying this happened at our school. Um, it means denouncing it like fast, saying this is not who we are, this is not who we do, this is not our values. Um, and when ready, it means sharing your plans. So if you are like, are the counselors going to be hosting conversations in classrooms to process what happened? Um, will there be a school-wide program coming? Are the doors open to come speak with you for those who have been affected or targeted? Uh, what steps are we taking in general just to help the school community? And I think something that gets forgotten a lot too is to share resources with families to say, hey, be part of this conversation with us. Like it, it can't just fall to us in the school. Um, you know, we, there are many organizations out there, ADL included, that have family discussion guides to help um, parents talk about sexism, anti-Semitism, racism, um, ableism, et cetera, with their kids at home. Um, I'm actually going to paste a link in the chat right now to the, that resource on our end, but making sure once again that it doesn't fall just to you and naming all those appropriate stakeholders who need to be informed and clued into the conversation for what's happening. Um, is something that needs to be reiterated and hopefully your voice can be a part of. Um, and a lot of what Kelsey was just talking about in the communicate piece also falls into the educate piece. So like sharing resources is part of this last um, piece to the piece. Ha, huh, sorry, I just, <laughs> just realized I was using the other piece in that sense, but a piece of piece, there you go. Um, I guess I just think that's funny, that's just me. Okay, so um, our last step is educate. So turning these bias motivated incidents into teachable moments. So not just, you know, trying to cover them up and pretend like they didn't happen, but using them as an opportunity for the whole community to grow and be better together. Um, so you'll want to provide opportunities for all members of the school community to discuss and to process their thoughts and feelings around some of these incidents. Um, so, but also remembering to center the perspectives of the impacted communities, um, if it is safe, respectful, and appropriate to do so. Because sometimes you have to think about, does this actually risk retargeting the affected individual or the affected communities? So trying to really think about the big picture here. Um, educating all students on bias and how bias has very harmful effects um, and then also how to challenge bias is part of responding to incidents of bias. Um, educators, counselors, and administrators should coordinate together as a team um, interventions for students responsible for the bias incident. Um, but know that more kids are aware, affected 
and involved in these attitudes than what is just that, that one aggressor. Um, and then also thinking about the bystanders of these incidents. They're part of the incident, even though it's not a direct part, but they're impacted by what they see. Um, sometimes it's appropriate to respond and educate through whole school community ways, like holding a town hall, a vigil, an assembly, um, some sort of whole school gathering. These events can often help to convey information, elevate ally voices um, and personal stories, and provide an open forum for the community to heal, whether it's uh, a classroom, the whole school, or even a larger community around the school. Um, but always be very careful to not tokenize marginalized voices by asking members of the affected group um, to represent their community or culture in that way. Um, and then staff should have their own learning too. So in the short term, learning about the history and background of a current incident of bias can be very helpful, um, especially if you have to deal with something similar in the future. Um, and then in the long term, having staff uh, dive into their curriculum uh, with an anti-bias lens um, and also getting a professional development on leading these conversations um, with students and with families. And then after the incident, um, maybe you know, a week or six months down the road, circle back and convene as a group to debrief. How did things go? What can we learn from this experience? Um, and you know, maybe edit our policies or edit our form in a way to uh, improve moving forward. Um, so responding um, to incidents should never be a one and done approach. Um, Anti-bias education is a long-term process and preventing bias requires uh, an ongoing commitment from all stakeholders. Um, and a big part of reducing uh, incidents of bias means integrating anti-bias and bullying prevention strategies into the curriculum. Um, so I, next slide please. Um, another thing to remember is that bias is universal. Everyone has it. So we're talking about how do we eliminate these bias incidents. Um, it's more about challenging our bias because it's hard to think about eliminating it because everybody has it. It's ingrained in us as we develop into humans. Um, so the goal is to become aware of how bias ours and others um, affect perceptions and actions um, in these circumstances. So that was a lot of big picture things. Now we're gonna kind of dive more into responding in the short term before our small breakout. All right. So first off, you know, when we hear something from a student or we see a biased remark or hear a joke or what have you, our first responsibility is to stop the behavior no matter what. So whether or not we have 10 seconds because they're running off to the bus or they're about to log off on Zoom or whatever it is, we have to stop and say that is unacceptable, period. We can't let it slide. Um, we've, we've heard from students what that feels like if an adult hears that comment and says nothing. Um, even if they don't have time to address it in depth in that moment, we have to say something. I'm pasting another, uh, another resource into the chat, which is just a, a continuation of this conversation, which we ADL likes to call practicing zero indifference. Um, but even though I'm saying you have to intervene and you have to do something and say something in that moment, um, there are questions to consider for how and when, and uh, am I going to educate this, the, these students involved in this issue? Is it something I get to do right now in this exact moment that I have time for? Is it something I have to do later? Is it something that I want to do publicly, right? Is there a whole group of students, like Kathy said, with bystanders involved that I need to anticipate for right now? Or should this be done as a one-on-one? -on -one? Um, and if they are, if it is being done on a one on one or in that group setting, like there are some tips and tricks for for phrases you can use um, to actually interrupt that bias. So here are a few that we recommend. Um, and some of these are kind of in the moment and some can be in the moment and follow up or just follow up. Um, so the first one interrupt, like Kelsey said, stop the behavior. 
Um, so there's a variety of ways to do that. Um, some language that we use, for example, um, that sort of language or behavior is not okay. Every single student is um, an equal and valued member of our community. So that just stops it. Or if you have time for a conversation in the moment, you could say, um, ouch, let's talk about that a bit more. Um, and that helps the student understand that what they said has just caused you some harm. Um, but do be aware that you'll get, as you all know, um, probably some pushback. Um, and they'll say that they heard it you know, at home or on the media or blah, 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 blah. blah. Um, a good response to that is regardless of where you learned it, bias is not welcome in our school. Um, our second strategy that we recommend is ask questions. So asking questions like, what did you mean by that? Or what do you know about the meaning or history of that word? Lots of times they don't, I, I think I saw this in the chat earlier, um, students don't even really know what they're saying or doing um, when they use some of these symbols or words. And so helping them understand the history can go a long way. Um, and that leads us into another strategy. Um, explain the impact. So ask questions like, do you know how that symbol makes people feel? Um, or saying something like statements like that have a long history of causing pain, harm, and fear for entire communities. So these strategies are more if you definitely have the time to have a conversation with that student. Um, and then another one is broaden to universal behavior. Um, so saying something like, I don't think that's a insert bias comment here thing. Um, I think lots of different people have that quality um, or conversely bringing it to the individual um, by saying something like, do you mean everyone who is insert bias comment here or are you speaking about someone in particular? Um, and then the last one is connecting to historical context. Um, so this goes along with the explaining the impact a bit. So saying things like what you said feel feeds into an old stereotype. Let's talk about where that comes from so that they understand what they're saying is a stereotype and is hateful. Um, and then they can really dive into the history a bit more. And I mean, in these incidents, how you support the target or how you address the aggressor are gonna depend for you, right? It's gonna depend on the age of your students. It's gonna depend on the incident itself. Um, but I do wanna point out just some highlights for you to consider for how you're going about going to this student or going to this student or going to the group at large, which is first, after just stopping the behavior, obviously you're gonna go support that targeted student. Um, and ask if they're okay and reaffirm their value and, and you know, point out to them that that is unacceptable to you. But for an elementary age student, that actually might mean having a private conversation with their families first before inviting that student because their families um, are understanding the impact. They're part of that community that was targeted and it's affecting them in that different way. And you know, when you're asking um, a, a targeted student, somebody who heard that comment or was part of the community or was the butt of that joke, Recognizing that they um, might say they're okay, even though they need support, because they would, don't want further marginalization, right? They don't want to be further stigma. So being flexible and providing that support, mindfully observing them after the incident to kind of see what's going on there, and then checking in often is, is a really key part of supporting those students. And of course, we have to recognize that um, their reactions are gonna be different. Different students have different reactions to these bias, these bias incidents, and they might wanna process with different people that aren't us. So encouraging them to you know, reach out to an affinity group or a club organization or a family member um, or just a different adult to continue safe processing means it doesn't have to just end with you. Again, it shouldn't all fall on the counselor's plate and that might be okay and appropriate for that student if they're reacting and, and need a different person or a different identity even to process with. Now, no matter what you want, you will never accomplish everything you, you go out to do when you're um, uh, responding to a bias incident. Um, so, Follow up, like you gotta schedule the follow up, sit down and write down when you're gonna do that, um, plan that with your team and think about where there's gonna be additional reflection, um, learning and dialogue, again, as a whole community. 
especially if the perpetrator or the aggressor is unknown, right? If we're having Zoom bombing or vandalism, there might not be the one student that you're going to explain the impact to. So if you are working with the entire school on that historical context or the entire school on understanding that impact of bias, or for elementary students, all the staff or an entire group of parents um, so that they can continue their learning and be prepared to have those conversations with students at, at, as appropriate for their age level um, helps like bring it back to like take it out of the bubble that sometimes we forget it isn't in. And trying our best not to frame this as punitive, right? Like Kathy said, anti-bias um, education should be all the time. It shouldn't be um, a feeling like this is because of that thing that we're being punished by this learning, but rather it's a good thing for, and it, it, it's part of our school culture um, to make sure that everyone feels safe. It's who we are. And using phrases, well, when, when kids use phrases, like it was just a joke or I didn't mean it like that, you know, reminding them that it's not about the intent. Um, questions like, you know, how do you think that community that you just mentioned would be impacted by that language and bringing it back there to, to tie that together and convey that it's not about intent is important because um, I that excuse doesn't get us very far. Lastly, I, I just want to point out that, you know, bias is messy. Um, we don't often have all of these specific rules for how every incident should go. And you're going to leave conversations feeling like this didn't go as planned or I didn't finish here. Um, and that's okay. You might not have the exact right words and you might not respond to it perfectly every time. But as long as you respond to it, right, you do that in the moment um, intervention, feel free to revisit, right? Going back to that very first decision I mentioned in which you are going to say, huh, like I, I can say that's not okay what I just saw, but give yourself space, go collect your thoughts, find a resource, reach out to a community partner to say, hey, this just happened. Um, what can I do? do? What do you got? And then come back, right? Incidents of bias, tackling them really and truly with impact, they require multiple conversations. So with all of that in mind, um, a lot of information we just laid on you. There really are a lot of questions to consider because we said it really depends. We are going to have the opportunity to discuss together. Um, we're going to be putting you in breakout groups right now. So be prepared for this to be interactive, please, and be ready to talk with colleagues across the county. Um, you're going to be headed into breakout rooms for about 13 minutes, and you are going to be um, going over some scenarios together with three different questions to consider. Um, you're going to take about a minute uh, to assign, kind of say hello and assign who's going to be paying attention to the time and who's going to be typing. And then you're going to take three minutes and answer the questions quickly about the scenario. What would you do? And then after three minutes, you're going to move to the next one. And then after three minutes, you're going to go to the last one. And then you're going to come back to that original one and kind of decompress about the summary of the wisdom of this group, because Kathy and I are here to give some best practices, but really y'all are the ones in the field doing this every single day. So the link is in the chat. Um, please make sure to open it. Um, now, I'm sure at least one person in your group will have access. If one person isn't able, that's okay. Again, you can have that conversation. Um, but you're going to head into those breakout rooms for, for a few minutes. Lena, are we, are we able to send, send folks? Yep, ready to go. All right, then um, we'll see you back here in 13 minutes, folks. And what should have been this screen? Okay, in these last few minutes, um, I just want to share with folks some resources that you can use. You know, you, you asked some questions in the chat about what you can actually use for this stuff and what have you. Um, this guide, Responding to Bias Incidents Guide, is like 70 pages and was uploaded to your sketch. And it does have a lot of these questions to consider, a lot more than we um, said. Uh, those Some of the things you'd want to be collecting, for example, in that bias incident report, and it, to go into it in more depth rather than just listening to me and Kathy. And just a note on that guide, I know she's going to dive into it, but the last page is an addendum for elementary schools. Yeah, so it's all, even though it says middle and high school, it's all very relevant to you, but there's just a couple considerations that have been added. Now, there's also a list of uh, like the historical context and questions to ask and answer when an incident actually has happened. They're based off of the incidents that um, ADL sees most often. Um, and they uh, are, they're not obviously all inclusive, but they list a whole bunch of different types of bias incidents. And you can use these as a template to prepare your team. 
um, and things I'm about to paste into the chat for you all is we also just have tons of resources for continuing these conversations uh, in general with your kids, right, on these um, topics with, with it being either proactive or reactive, right? It doesn't have to be um, always reactive, but it, it, you know, it could be. And um, I'm also, there we go, last one. So those all exist on ADL.org. And then lastly, um, a proactive approach could be um, implementing no place for hate. I know some of your schools already are a no place for hate school. Um, and if not, feel free to reach out, out to Kelsey or me. Um, you can also, I'm gonna paste into the chat now, um, a link to our website so you can read more about it and register your school for next year. Um, and try to definitely think about if you're coming from an elementary school, interrupting your bias that tells you that young children aren't ready or capable for having these conversations. They are, and they should be happening early and often. Um, so check out No Place for Hate. It's a great way to be proactive about this work. Both of those are in the chat. And in that last, um, the last 60 seconds, we've pasted a feedback form for you all and knowing that it's exactly two o'clock. So I don't know if we're gonna get like literally cut off, Lena. Will you go to the last slide so they can see our email addresses? Yes. Perfect. Here are our email addresses. Um, I'm typing them in the chat for you as well. So you can reach out about any of this. If questions come up, if you want to think about what it means to be a no place for hate school, if you just have an incident occur and you're like, yo, you said we're your community partner, we're calling you, we're taking a step, we're taking a break. What do we do? What even, do you if you're, even if you're not a no place for hate school, reach out. We are here as a free resource to you. Thank you all so much. Kelsey and I will hang out for just a little bit if you have any specific questions um, or as you run out to your next. Uh, don't get me in trouble by not filling out your feedback form because we were supposed <laughs> to paste it in there two minutes ago and only did it one minute ago. So we appreciate that. I don't know if it's on one of the links that we saw in the chat. Is there a copy of the of a reporting form that we can share back with our sites? So there's not, there's not a form, but in that large guide, there's the questions that could be like asked, right? What you're going to be trying to take, um, pay attention to. And I like, it would be something you'd create on your own, but there's a lot of that information in there to create that, if that makes okay. sense. Okay. Yeah. Thank you very much. Cool. You, for the feedback form, the last one you, you pasted our No Place for Hate website. Oh, okay. <laughs>